So let's go into installing base system. So selecting mirrors. Now, <clears throat> this mirror select is a program you won't have if you've not booted the minimal CD or the live DVD from Gen 2. So you'd have to run this. Um, well, you'd have to emerge mirror select when we're in the Troot environment to get the same effect, then run this command here. Um, otherwise, I assume the default would be that it would just download all the information from the um, standard Gen 2 servers, which is probably not what you want to do. So you, when we're in the truth, if you, got, if you have been unable to install Mirror Select, emerge Mirror Select, let it install, and then come back and do these commands to add add this the mirrors to the make.conf but I'm in the minimal environment it's gen 2 produce CD so this will work so I'll run that command and you'll see what happens in a minute it comes up with a nice little uh, front end where you can select mirrors that are close to you and these mirrors are used for synchronizing and fetching packages and so on Okay, so as you can see, the countries on the right, the web pages or the not web pages, the uh, URLs for the servers are on the left. So all I need to do is just scroll down till I get to UK servers. There's some there, and just press spacebar to put a star in each line for the servers you want to select. Um, my option you want, for example, French or German servers. They're reasonably close by. There's some German ones there. And French ones, so you, could, you know, in this country, I'll optionally add them in. And once you've done, you just press enter. And what that's done now, it's written those servers that I selected, it's written the URLs to the make.conf. And you can see down here, it's created that line with all the servers that I selected. So that's the servers. The next thing we've got to do is to configure a repository. And the repository is like a catalog of all the packages um, available in the Gen 2 syst portage system. So what we need to do is create a directory for the repositories because you can have more than one. You can um, you know, have custom repositories if you like. And then we can create a default one called gen2.conf by copying an existing one which has already been supplied to us and then we can view that configuration file and optionally modify it if you need to now because I run my own repository server I'm going to change this line here so that it points at my own server um, it just means that I'm not hammering the Gen 2 server so much I've got several machines that run Gen 2 so that's why I run my own server it only needs to connect once a day it's on a cron job it fetches the updates and it just sits there and then it means that on any of my machines when I synchronize those other machines rather than hammering the Gen 2 server you know, six times or whatever, I just go to my local copy without having to uh, hit the Gen 2 servers all the time. So I'm just going to look in another terminal to see what it should be set to. I think I know what it is, but I just want to make sure. Uh, Okay. So I'll just change this to the IP address of the machine. It is nice and simple. Yep, that's it. And as you can see, the other lines are more or less exactly the same as what's in the handbook. The only difference is we've got an extra line here which looks like it verifies the signature. 
which is probably why we've got all these key GPG settings, PGP settings. So I'll save that with X. And the next thing I'm going to do is to copy the resolve.conf information that the, the mini minimal Gen 2 CD has booted from. And we're going to copy that into our new Gen 2 system. Um, I'm actually going to modify that as well because um, I run my own name, name server. Uh, sorry, not name server. Well, I do run a name server. But it's also got a domain, so I'm going to put that in as well. Um, and it is mynet.org. I think that's right. I'll check that as well. And you can see it's picked up my local name server when it's booted and also another one. I'm not sure where it's got that from, whether that's from my router or, or one I've set. I can't remember now. So I'll save that. And the next thing we've got to do is to mount some um, virtual file systems. Now it says here down here, the make our slave operations are needed for system D support later in the installation. So... Um, don't run system D so probably don't need to add those in so I'll skip those ones I'll just add in the first second and fourth so we're just attaching these virtual file systems into our gen 2 hierarchy so that when we run the true command um, we'll have access to those virtual file systems it says when using non Gen 2 installation media, this might not be sufficient. It suggests to run these commands. Now, I think we can run these anyway in the Gen 2 system without any harm. And then we can run the true command. And there we go. We're now into the true. So if I do ls minus l. You can see our stage trees, all these directories are created when we expanded the stage tree. We can source the profile that's in this environment. And the last command is to just alter the prompt to remind us that we're actually in a true environment, not a real environment. And as it says here, we've still got loads of things, well, a few things to do, even though we're in an environment. And it says if you want to you know, interrupt what you're doing at any point, um, need to shut down the computers, whatever. As it says, no need to repartition, just mount the root, copy the DNS info again, and copy the, uh, do these commands again for the virtual file systems, and then rerun these true commands, and you'll be back to uh, where we are now. You can carry on then. So I'll need to run this command to mount the boot partition, but remembering that the boot partition is SDA1 that's so that we can install the kernels into the boot partition so if I do df-h you can see we've got our root partition which is SDA3 and the boot partition which is SDA1 you can see it's virtually empty so next we need to get the latest repository snapshot um, and as it says here, you can run this command if you're behind a firewall. It's a bit restrictive. This is the command to run. Um, otherwise, you can run emerge sync, which is the standard command to sync up the repository. So if I run this now, this is going to take a little while. Although it's local, it's probably got a few changes to make. So um, it will take uh, you know, five or ten minutes or so. In fact, I'll uh, time it. Uh, and also it says if you are a slow link like a serial console or something you can add the quiet switch just so it doesn't print anything to the screen to make it run a little bit faster but um, I'm just going to run it as it is and wait for it to complete
Okay, so that's the synchronization finished. Um, you'll find if you do this on a SSD, it's a lot faster because um, there are points where it's quite discontensive. But as you can see, it says um, there are six news items. Generally, if any important updates to the system, there'll be a news item um, which you need to read. It says here how to do that. You can use this command E select, which has a number of modules associated with it, and each one of them has got its own commands. Generally, is a list command to see what the state of each module is, um, and various other commands for setting or enabling certain features. But in this case, we want the news one, and you just type in news, and as you can see, well, if you type news by itself, you'll see the commands that are available, so you can count the items, list the items, purge, read, and unread the item, items, and then each of those have got like sub options as well. So if we just do list, news list, you'll see they're all blue at the moment, they've got this N meaning their new uh, news items that haven't been read yet and generally at this stage installing the system most of these aren't going to be anything to worry about they're more to do with changes to an existing system so for example the first one um, there was a variable in the make.conf which we've been looking at at editing called linguas and that's where you can specify um, local languages to be installed with certain packages for example LibreOffice has got lots of languages and Firefox is so if you wanted a specific language installed you'd specify that language in that variable name well they changed the name of that variable to L10N localization and that's what that message is about saying that you know eventually linguas will be removed and L10N is the one to use and I think it uses a different format and to read that, we could do e select news, read, and the number on the left here of that item we want to read. So if I do that now, it'll pull this out, and you can see there's all, a load of information there. So it's quite important to read these um, news items because um, there will be changes that impact the system. Possibly some, sometimes it's packages you haven't got or stuff you don't use that you're not interested in, but. Uh, it's good to to read them just to make sure. Sometimes they're extremely important. There might be a profile change, which is the bit that, well, we'll, we'll go on to that in just a moment. It's the bit that governs how the system's built, what packages are pulled in and so on. Um, other important ones that occur are GCC upgrades. Um, it specifies what to do, especially if there's been an ABI change. Um, there's certain procedures you need to do. And as you can see, there's been a few with Python lately because they're trying to get rid of Python 2.7, um, which was deprecated uh, end of life support, I think January 1st this year. Um, but there's still some packages using that. And they've also deprecated the use of Python 3.6 a few months ago as well. So that's probably what that news item was about. So you can read them. Um, like I say, they probably won't have a great deal of importance in this environment because we're starting from refresh so we just start using the current situation as it is um, so yeah you can read them by uh, specifying each news item or you can just do e select news read and it will just read all of them they'll just be displayed all to the screen scrolling off the end of the screen and um, that's one quick way to get rid of them all as unread, but like I say, I would read them all individually. So you can see there's like loads of different bits of information there. So a uh, profile, as it says, a profile is a building block for any Gen 2 system. Um, it specifies default values such as use flags, see, see flags, use flags will come too soon. Um, and locks the system to a certain range of package versions as well. Um, this all, all to make things just a little bit easier for us. So if I run this command, I select profile list. It will list all available profiles. 
for 32 bit and as you can see on each line they vary slightly there's a hierarchy so there's the bog standard one we're on at the moment which is stable version there's an SE Linux profile there's a hardened there's hardened with SE Linux there's a desktop profile etc with GNOME with Plasma and so on EXP is experimental so probably less likely to get support with them or you'd be expected to provide feedback maybe um, the desktop ones are quite handy if you're new to Gen 2 and a bit unsure because they'll provide you with a, a good stable desktop environment um, in terms of flags and um, use settings and so on but for my purposes I generally keep it at the um, box standard and just adjustings myself but like I say you might want to set one of these options so normally you just do this command here eselect profile set to so that would set the SE Linux profile active um, if you wanted a desktop without specifying no more plasma for example you wanted LXDE you would do eselect profile set 5 to get a, a basic desktop profile so like I say I'm just going to leave that and I'm going to change that then it says um, yeah, developer profile is for Gen 2 development, so I don't think we've got one of those there. Oh, yes, we have. Yeah, there it is. So although it's stable, it does say it's um, just for Gen 2 Linux development, not meant to be used by casual users. So basically only, only use that profile if you know what you're doing. Um, it says at this point now, it's wise to update the system's world set. So what there is in a default Gen 2 system is there's two lists what are known as sets there's a system set which is basically the current programs or tools that are installed and these are referenced by the profile um, you can't generally see them um, but then there's a world set which is the programs we tell Gen 2 specifically we want installed on the system and that is visible. That's visible in, um, well, it would be empty at the moment because we haven't installed anything yet, but it's visible in far, lib, portage, and then there's normally a world, yeah, it's there. Yeah, it's empty. That file is just a text file listing all the packages that have been installed and more specifically, packages that mustn't be removed automatically. So, for example, if I were to install LibreOffice, I would add it to the system using a merge, and I would do it in such a way that LibreOffice would get added to that world file. And that means that any time that I clear up any packages automatically using the um, Portage tools, the fact that it's in the world set, i.e. it's in that file, means that it must not be removed from the system unless I explicitly remove it. When you emerge packages, you have to specify, if you, if you want to add something, but not add it permanently, i.e. you only want to add it because it's a dependency and not explicitly add it, there's a an extra command you have, or an extra switch you have to add in to say only add this package while it's dependency of another one as soon as it becomes orphaned it can be removed from the system automatically and we'll look into that a little bit closer as we add and as a, as a demonstrate adding and removing packages now um, quite a few places in Gen 2 documentation you'll see this as a pretty standard um, command to update the system um, what it does it all the existing packages which is as I say basically all the packages that are in the system set it, it that that line will update them to the very last very uh, latest version that's in the repository so if you recall we've just updated the repository with the emerge sync command now that's up to date that's more up to date than the packages that are installed in the system so this command will go and compare the versions that are in the repository to the installed versions of the program and if it finds any new or any discrepancies basically because sometimes very occasionally some packages get reverted down a, a level for whatever reason um, it will identify those and it will give us the option to 
um, rebuild those packages and therefore update the system to the latest um, versions or latest stable versions. Now one thing with this is that I've found over the years there's some extra options that I've found useful. Um, there's one in particular I found out about ooh, a year, yeah, probably about six months a year ago, um, which I think is quite important. I use it all the time now. As I seem, it seems that when I use it, I get fewer problems with package dependencies and things going wrong. So what I should do is um, I'm just going to go onto another machine and get this command up and show you it and then you've got the choice whether to go with what the book says or um, use this one. Now I'm copying this command off of a server I, I've got which is basically just an, an Intel Atom, a basic, it's an actually a basic uh, EEE PC, one of the first uh, EEE ASUS PCs. So it's got two cores, so it can run two jobs. Um, but I'll show you some things I change on this. Uh, I generally do a time command to see how long the compile takes because you'll get to know which packages take time to compile and you can decide when to run the updates, um, whether to delay them and so on. Because although you know some packages are quite small, they can take quite a while to compile, and vice versa. You may get a big package that you know might just be a load of images or something, for example, just to install in a directory, and it doesn't take that long to um, build and install. But you can see this is an adaptation of that command. Um, this AV switch here, that's actually the equivalent of ask is the A and V is the verbose, so that bit's the same. The world bit, the at world, that specifies the at means user set, and then that's the name of the set afterwards. Um, you can see the deep bit's the same, the update is the same, um, and that's oh, and new use is the same. Um, so I've added a few extra options here, which just sort of covers everything for day to day updating of a, a Gen 2 system. So if I go through and explain each option, each uh, part of it, so obviously the time command is going to time how long this emerge takes to run, and that includes the time where it shows us what it wants to update, and it's sitting there waiting for us to say yes or no, we do want to update the system. So bear that in mind. If you run the command, go away for a day and come back and do no, it will have said that the emerge command has run for eight hours, even though it Know, two minutes to run or whatever it was sitting there most of its time just waiting for you to press yes or no the update saying like update all the packages in the world in the set that you specified in this case the world set the new use command says look for any changes with the use flags which we'll see more of um, we've seen no we haven't seen them yet uh, the change use again the same thing but any changes to the use flags I think the deep does some, I think it goes down the tree a little bit deeper, um, looks looks harder at um, what dependencies might be affected. I can't remember what the BDEPS does. Um, no, I can't remember what that does. BDEPS is binary dependencies, so whether it takes into account packages, there are some packages that you can install as a binary package rather than compiling them from source. So whether it's to do with that or not, I can't really remember. But um, I've obviously considered it important enough to put it in there. Backtrack, um, yeah, I put that quite high. Normally, I reckon 30 is enough. Um, I use that so high to resolve any um, dependencies that um, I'm having difficulty with. So I think I just tend to leave that as a thousand. Jobs is the number of packages to be building at the same time, but bear in mind the minus J that we put in with the make ops in the make.conf file. Each one of these jobs will use the number of make ops jobs. So it's basically this number times the number we set in make.conf. 
is the number of free cores or processes you'll need to effectively compile. Um, so I'm actually going to keep that as one. Um, another thing to mention about this is that if jobs is set to two or higher, when it's compiling you'll just get one line saying it's emerging it and another line saying it's installing it and that's all you'll get. When jobs is set to one or you don't specify it at all, you'll get to see all the source output to the screen as it compiles it. So if I set that to one initially, and then this is this last switch here, this last option is the option that I found out recently. It seems to take more dependencies into account. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works, um, but ever since then I've had fewer problems with updating packages where there's been you know inconsistencies or errors occur and yeah things I can't put a finger on. Um, so it does mean that the updates take longer because it's recompiling more uh, packages. So I, I would recommend that I think if, if you can uh, take into account that uh, updates are going to take longer because there'll be more packages to um, compile up. But it's worth it because you get fewer problems in, in my opinion, my experience anyway. So like I say, this is my preferred um, update command and this gets used a lot so it's always in the history of the root so it's easy to recall. So I'm going to press enter now and after a minute or so it's going to, in fact it might be less than that because we're in a brand new system, there's fewer packages to look at um, but after a short while it will come back and it will show us the packages it's identified that need to be updated or altered for whatever reason. And the ask and verbose are quite important uh, switches. The ask gives you the option to say yes or no, you do want to install these. So I'd say that's quite important because really you should go through and identify, or oh, sorry, um, uh, review what, what the system wants to do because you might spot something that you're not happy with. You might, for example, want an option built in, which is what these um, use flags are, this part here. So the red is a use flag that is um, already built in, it's already been compiled in. The green is a change, so for example this is uh, going to be removed, this option. Um, and the yellow with the percent, I think they are uh, options that have been specified by the package maintainer. So that's like being um, unset. Uh, yeah, the minus is unset as well, and if there's no minus in front of it, then the, the option's being set. So, for example, that one, Python 3.9, is being set. And we can't override that either because it's in brackets. Um, yeah, these two here, these file caps are being set. Uh, they're they're new, new options. Um, and the verbose just gives a little bit more information. It gives it gives the use flag information. So the ask asks us whether we want to continue. Otherwise, this will just list this up and start compiling, and we wouldn't have had the chance to review it. So it's definitely advisable to have ask. And the verbose is a good option just to review uh, what use flags are going to be compiled in. Um, like I say, you might want to decide, oh, I want, um, for example, libedit added into OpenSSH, so you could do no here, modify the file to add in libedit, which we'll see in a, in a while, and then rerun this command, and you'll see libedit in green shown it's going to be compiled in, and just check that you're happy with that, and then compile it. So I'm just going to press enter here to accept the default of yes, and get these packages rebuilt with the latest changes.
So those updates have completed and if you'll notice that at the end of an update if there's any messages associated with a package then that message will be printed out. So for example we've got Pam here and it's saying that um, anything that's using the Pam library should be um, basically stopped and restarted um, using this command to find out which libraries are using the PAM library or simply to reboot the system. Well we've still got some configuration still to go um, so we'll ignore that package for now. Um, shouldn't run into any problems, don't normally when uh, I don't immediately deal with that message from PAM so it should be okay. So next we move on to the um, use variables now this is one of the key features of Gen 2, I, th I believe over all other um, Linux systems, certainly the pre-compiled ones, that's for sure. Um, basically you've got two levels of use flags. You've got use flags that can appear in the make.conf file, which we've already seen. And then there are other, and they are global, they affect all packages. And then there are per package flags, which can either appear in a config file or individual config files, depending on how you set up your system. Um, by default, they seem to encourage using individual config files, um, which I've tried, I don't really like. And when, when I come to look at that individual file, um, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about why I prefer the old way of having a single config file. Um, so if you ever report a problem to the Gen 2 people they tend to want to know how you've got your um, Gen 2 system configured and the emerge minus minus info command lists a lot of information about how your Gen 2 is configured, what flags you've got um, what optimizations and so on. So you can see here, this is the sort of information that comes out, the portage version, what version of Python you've got, uh, the profile, the compiler, the C library and the kernel and what architecture you're using. Things like the system name, amount of memory and so on, key packages, what version they are. Um, the repository synchronization details and then a load of variables that some we've set for example the C flags and as you can see CXX flags and others that are predefined based on the profile you can see the Gen 2 mirrors we set up with that little tool there's make ops and you'll see one here that's the use string all of these have been pre-configured so all these flags are turned on for any package that has got this flag it will be compiled with this feature automatically and this is what this command does it will just display the contents of the use variable and you can see there it is again and it also displays, because it's all on, also on the same line, a load of other um, variables that are configured, which we don't need to worry about at the moment. Um, there is a list of the valid use variables always available, and there it is. So you can see the use variables here. So, for example, this one IMAP, and it gives a quick description of what it does. So there's quite a few there, and these are all the global variables. And to use that, we can edit the make.conf. I'll use Vi again. Okay, we haven't got Vi inside the true environment, so I'm going to have to use Nano. And we can just add the use.
flags in here. So one that appeared um, in that list is IPv6. Now I don't use IPv6, so what I'm going to do is override that. So normally when you add something in, you just type the name of the use flag in and that is now activated IPv6 for every single package that might want to use it. I want to override that and disable it for every single package because I don't use it. So all I do is just put a minus in front of it. Now if I save this and rerun the update command, because I've got the changed use uh, switch there, I can just recall that, rerun it. Other things like the update and new use will be ignored because there aren't any new use flags. There aren't any updates. Uh, that's why I keep reusing this. That's why I think it's quite a useful command to have. I don't need to think about have I just changed something? Have I have I added a use flag? Uh, the emerge package will uh, just work things out for me. And you can see the example they've got there that they've configured to not install anything with GTK or GNOME, but they want Qt 4 and 5, KDE, DVD support, ALSA support, and CDR support. Um, uh, right, okay, so you can see how many packages that this has touched just by removing the IPv6. So as you might imagine, there's lots of network-related packages, but also some that haven't got the IPv6, so for example, uh, oh no, sorry, looks like they all have directly got it. It could be sometimes that uh, you might remove a flag and there are other dependencies which need to be rebuilt because of that. Um, but in this case, it looks like every single package is directly related. Um, you'll also notice the size of the downloads. Um, so any that we haven't been, haven't, hasn't been built already or rebuilt. So for example, we've updated this one today and that's why it's a download size of zero kilobytes because the archive the, of sources, the tarball of sources used to build that has already been downloaded, so there's no no need to download it again. So we've got 71 megabytes of new archives, new tarballs that need to be downloaded. Um, I won't update that at the moment. Um, sometimes it's best to integrate any updates immediately and other times if you know you've got more changes to to do it's sometimes best to leave it and then um, do your changes and then do um, an update to integrate everything all together uh, it can save a bit of time um, we've got an option to, here to d ignore default use flags so this little bit here it says minus star that that effectively is saying uh, disable every single use flag um, but this warning here, as it says, it's um, discouraged because defaults are carefully chosen. So in this case, this use flag is saying disable everything. Then once everything's disabled, enable X. So enable X Windows, ACLs, and ALSA. Anything to do with ACL or ALSA or X Windows. But don't don't normally do that. It's not really necessary to do that. There's then a bit about configuring the accept license variable. Um, some packages have certain licenses and they're associated or grouped together uh, depending on what license type they fall into. So you can enable um, certain licenses depending on either what you want to install from a moral point of view or ethical point of view or um, for various other reasons. Um, and it says it com comes with predefined license. So if we run this command here, you'll see that by default everything that's free that's installed. Um, if, for example, you want your binary re redistributables, you, you could add this in. And again, this goes into make.conf. You'd add in... Um, a binary redistributable redist into accept license variable. Now I don't use this this way. I tend to keep a separate package license file and then just add them in like this. So for example, if I was to add in the unra package, that's got an unra license. I would add that line to a package.license file 
this example they've got here is like individual files again, as I was explaining with the use files, um, which I tend not to use. I don't really like that. So that's something when we come across that, I'll show you what I do with that. But you can either use it with groups of software like this. So if you want all the you know, miscellaneous free document licensed um, stuff, um, then just add it into the accept license. And you'll notice a lot of these build on previous ones. So there's GPL and then the free approved includes GPL compatible as well as the free software licenses and so on. And you can see the free software combines several of these subcategories. Uh, there's a bit here about system D. I'm not using system D. I don't really like it. I don't really get on with it much. So I continue to use the um, system V rather than system D system. But obviously, if you want to do that, then that's a slightly different configuration. Uh, next thing we need to do is to set up the time zone. So if we look at the zone info file, as it suggests here, you can see that these all the zones are available and some are in subdirectories. So for example, I'm in the UK, which is in Europe. So if you look inside that directory, you'll see the mostly capitals, if not all of them capitals of countries in Europe. And obviously London is of interest to me. So what we do is we use this information and we put the directory, if there is one, and the file, we copy that into ETC time zone. So if I copy this, I'm not in Brussels, I'm in London, as I've said. So all I need to do is to paste that there and press enter. And it's worth noting it says to avoid using the GMT time zones as they don't work as expected. So next we need to configure this time zone data package. So it looks like it's probably already installed. I just run a config command and it probably reads the CTC time zone we've just set up. Yeah, it does. So it's updated the ETC local time with that information. Next thing we need to do is to add some locales so let's do that so there's a default in there um, I need to add basically what the American one is here with the US and all I do is just change it to GB and also if you're unsure I'll just save that if you're unsure what um, locales are available you can look at this file here and if I look for GB you can see there's oh that's sorry I should look for EN underscore GB you can see there's the two there UTF-81 and an ISI-5591 so as long as I've got those two in the um, locale file, locale.gen, um, that should be uh, sufficient. So I'll just double check them again, and yeah, they look okay. So next, we need to generate these locales. Um, in fact, if we run locale minus a, we can see what already exists. So you can see the C, C.UTF8 and POSIX. Let's now run this command to generate the two locales I've added. Well, in fact, it's generating three. Okay. That may have been the one that was already in there. Okay, that's done. Now I can use the eselect command. You can see locale, it tells you how to use it. As an example, if I list 
I can see all the available locales and deep thought one is CUTF8 which is interesting one of the ones it built um, but I wish to set uh, one of the ENGBs as the default so to do that to deselect locale set and the index number next to the line I want to set so for example I want to set 5 I'll do 5 it tells me it's setting it to ENGB ISO 88591 um, I can do list again and I don't know if you can see that blue star has moved from the CUTF8 which has actually disappeared from the list and it's moved up to the ENGB ISO 5 uh, ISO 88591. Um, now it told me to run the source etc profile command. Um, I've actually got a bit more of a command here to do. It's probably because we're in a troot, so I'll run that instead, which includes the source etc profile command. And that's that for the localization.